how do you say the, the name of... All oh, right, uh, let me give you a tutorial. Aung San Suu Kyi. Aung San Suu Kyi? Yep, yes, you've got it. Not a problem. No, no. Aung San Suu Kyi. I last saw my wife 18 months ago. On that occasion, I was allowed to share her detention for about three weeks. Since then, I have been refused a visa to visit my wife in Burma. I last received a letter from her about a year ago today. All contact has ceased. I'm sorry I can't give you any more encouraging news of her. There was a time when Aung San Suu Kyi gave inspired speeches to the crowd from the garden wall of her home in Rangoon. Since 1988, she's been recognized worldwide as a sublime icon of the non-violent struggle for democracy in Burma. But she soon became a threat to the Burmese regime. And since 1989, Aung San Suu Kyi has been in and out of house arrest, confined for more than 15 years in her home. Political prisoners, they get terribly politicized. I think I became more political I was when I, after I was put under house arrest than before. Because once I was under house arrest, I became totally a political animal. Because this was my whole existence. I was under house arrest because of my politics, so politics became my whole life. But there was also a time in her life before politics. Only a few are aware that Aung San Suu Kyi once led an entirely different existence among Oxford academics with dinner parties and the British husband, two sons and a dog. A life and a family she abandoned abruptly and with fateful consequences. You decided to commit yourself to the country, to Burma. That meant uh, leaving behind uh, your husband and two sons. And this must have been a terrible dilemma. I never answer personal questions. If your life was able to be reeled back, 20 years, what would you like to see different that was done? Do you have any regrets? Would you have done anything differently? through this gateway here. And the lift in that room there, that big um, room on the left-hand side of the, of the um, front door. Um, I mean, look at all these letters. Uh, Dearest DT, yes, that's right. Oh. She called me DD. <laughs> Sue and Michael's wedding. These are the acceptances. Lots of love. She was always very crisp and sort of tightly put together, you know. Um, her skirts were tied tightly around her. And she was wearing these beautiful Burmese kind of 
uh, silk blouse and a sarong, you know, that was sort of wound around her beautiful little figure. She was very dainty, very graceful. Her hair was very nicely pulled back in a high ponytail and with a heavy fringe. Jet black hair and, you know, and some sort of ponytail, something with a flower in, behind her ear. And she was like something out of a fairy tale, you know, an oriental princess or something. And she moved like an oriental princess. She was very self-conscious, very conscious, I, I think, of her, her graces. You know, there's something about Sue which is sort of not ethereal because she's very down to earth, but she's sort of no limit hungry, you know, don't touch me. Uh, whereas for Michael, it was very much, he was very touchable. He was a great academic, a Tibetologist. He, well, you know from his, his writings that he started when he was a boy with this fascination for the um, for Southeast Asia. A wonderful academic. I mean, his books on Tibet and Himalayan Buddhism, all of them uh, fine works of scholarship. So he was, yeah, there was part of him which was an Edwardian gentleman, there was part of him which was an Oxford Don, there was part of him which was just f full of fun and, and perceptiveness. That intelligence and that determination is reflected in his character just as much as it is in, in Sue's. So they were naturally attracted to one another. Oh dear. Um. Yeah. Um. But one man loved the pilgrim soul in you and loved the sorrows of your changing face. And bending down beside the glowing bars, murmur a little sadly how love fled and paced upon the mountains overhead and hid his face amid a crowd of stars. Where do I live? Our home has been in Oxford in England since 1975. Although, of course, as a family, we've been visiting Burma very frequently up till 1988 when it all exploded. I was 20 and she was 19 and we had both come up to Oxford and we were at a, an all women's college called St. Hugh's, which was rather old fashioned. This was the um, mid 60s. The se sexual liberation really came to England in the 1960s and most of the people in my year were you know, desperate to get boyfriends, have affairs, you know, live the life. We were a kind of international group of friends. And um, one of the English girls was saying, but Sue, you must want to have an affair. You must want a lover. And she said, no, absolutely not. You know, I want to be a virgin when I marry my husband. Um, and uh, one of them must have said, you know, so what do you do now? And she said, well, I go to bed and I hug my pillow. <laughs> this was, so she was, was very different from the common English um, mode of people of our generation then. Yes, I suppose to, uh, uh, compared to a lot of Westerners, I'm straight list, and perhaps also uh, compared to a lot of Burmese too, we were brought up rather strictly because mm. my mother w was, uh, a disciplinarian. I have a sort of a uh, half memory that her, her mother was quite strict with her. Actually, I don't remember her talking about her very much because in England she was looked after by Lord and Lady Gore Booth. Lady Gore Booth's husband, Lord Paul Gore Booth, was the ambassador to Burma from 1949 to 1953. At that time, Burma was a British colony. A friend said, Rangoon, where's Rangoon? No, he'll soon be back. And Rangoon became, you know, it affected the rest of our life. We, we saw Sue with her mother at diplomatic functions and that sort of thing. She was in the government. She was Minister of Social Services. She was a remarkable woman. I think she had this two sides. She looked Burmese, 
She dressed Burmese. Of course, she also wore jeans. She also wore very casual clothes. But she never disguised herself as anything other than what she, her cultural, ethnic, you know, background. Burma is my country. For example, I never even thought of the possibility of taking up British citizenship. It was something that never occurred to me. I was born Burmese, and as far as I was concerned, I would be Burmese until the end of my life. Yes. Although, mind you, I don't think I was really born a Burmese citizen as such, because Burma was not independent at the time I was born. Aung San Suu Kyi was sent to England to receive what her mother considered to be a proper education. But she became a, a third daughter in our family. And uh, my family get very annoyed because I always said that she was the most dutiful of them all. She was always the first one to offer to wash up or wear. Still retained all the traditional graces of, of her training. And yet, full of charm, full of fun, very intelligent. She has a very, very sweet and very loving and very sensitive uh, and, and kind of all-embracing side. But she also has a very, very iron-hard, determined, uh, you might al almost call it a ruthless side to her character, that she will pursue her goal, whatever it is, to the end. It is with a sense of great pride and much joy that I've come here from the other side of the world to accept on behalf of my brave wife, Sue, this high honor. It is a role I've had to play many times, and our sons too. Not as her political spokesman, but simply as members of her immediate family who enjoy the freedom to travel which she is herself denied. Sue is inspired by the certain knowledge that her country will only blossom when the hand of fear is lifted from her people and their talents are thereby released. She believes this can only happen when all put aside their differences to establish civilian rule based on the popular will. If one reflects, she did have a feeling of mission, I think, about Burma from quite early on. And it was in spite of that mission, feeling of mission, that she decided to marry somebody she loved. The Burmese style of our wedding was in our home with uh, Evelyn and John, Michael's parents. It was a lovely ceremony. At their Buddhist wedding, on the sitting room floor of Paul and Pat Gorbun's house in Chelsea. I was one of those who walked around them with the holy thread. What a wonderful bond that was to prove to be. Oh, she had many challenges to overcome, really. A, in, in marrying a um, foreigner in living in another country, in bringing up her children, in not finding anybody in her own country whom she could look up to as a possible leader, successor to her father, or even to someone that she might join with in marriage. <laughs> It takes courage to rebel, and perhaps, perhaps she was saying to her mother, well, this is my choice, and you know, whether you like it or not. They complemented each other, um, and, you know, it was a marriage made in heaven. Um, not because it was all roses, because it wasn't, it was a a very rocky road. The marriage started with the uh, conventional assumptions that the husband is more important than the wife and that 
in spite of everything that Michael did subsequently, I think it, you know, there was that element to the marriage. She used to t tell me also about, you know, the strains in their relationship because all women complain about their husbands to their best friends, don't they? And it's the safe way of doing it. And of course there were strains because he had his own career to pursue. When Michael was establishing his reputation as a Tibetan scholar, and Sue was living to the full her role as housewife and mother. Ironing Michael's socks, I recall, as a particular manifestation of the former role. It was an activity she performed with pride and a certain defiance of her more feminist friends. I don't think either of the, the um, babies were easy. It was a very tense time for Sue because Michael was trying to finish his doctoral thesis and she was having all this trouble with Kim trying to feed him and not being able to. I still have this visual memory of her in winter time in her flat in Oxford, a big room um, with the lights low, um, the curtains drawn, it's winter time, it's dark, and she's kneeling on the car carpet with warm oil and massaging this baby. It was a, you know, a very, it was a sensible and intelligent and tender thing to be doing to make up for what she wasn't able to do. The early first 15 years of their marriage, it was all Michael. Michael was the fellow of St. Anthony's. He was a fellow of St. John's. He was a great scholar of Bhutanese and Himalayan Buddhism. He was the uh, biographer of the 13th Dalai Lama. Um, yeah, he, he was the the breadwinner he was the core of that marriage and and sue was um, yeah he, she was the helpmate uh, she was the north oxford housewife she was the the person who well was her father's daughter but yet in a transmogrified into this north oxford inheritance and he was a serious scholar absolutely but it it, it was not the thing that i think she thought was um, um you know wonderful and to be admired no <laughs> She didn't talk about it in those terms. From the vantage point of the 80s, my image of Sue was very much of someone who was casting around for a role for herself, for a position for herself. And she said, well, is this my destiny to be an Ox North Oxford housewife and to be, you know, the uh, partner of an uh, Oxford Don? She was becoming more serious, more focused, more determined. Um, more ambitious. Sue, at some stage in the 80s, was contemplating a PhD, and um, I remember advising, she was thinking of going to Michigan or doing a PhD at SOAS. All those years spent as a full-time mother were most enjoyable and rewarding. But the gap in professional and academic activities, although I did manage to study Tibetan and Japanese during that time, makes me feel somewhat at a disadvantage compared to those who were never out of the field. She tried to do postgraduate work and was refused by the college that she applied to. And so then she started writing her father's biography. She gave me this book and she said, this is about my father. And um, I then understood who she was, but I didn't know who she was. She never talked about it when we were young. In January 1947, Suu Kyi's father, Ong Sam, led a delegation to London to negotiate independence with the Labour government of Kanantakli. There were many in Britain, including opposition leader Winston Churchill, who would have had Ong Sam tried for war crimes. Less than four years earlier, he had presided as Minister of War in the Japanese-backed Burmese administration in Rangoon. My colleagues and I have come to London in response to the invitation of His Majesty's government in order to discuss constitutional questions of Burma. The demand of our people is complete independence. Her father, General Aung San, was assassinated on the 19th of July, 1947. When he was assassinated, he is only 33 years old. All this life is only on one goal, 
that is to, to have Burma liberated from the British. When I was young, I could never really separate my country from my father because I was very small when he died and I'd always thought of him in connection with my country. So even now, it's difficult for me to separate the idea of my father from the concept of my country. I don't think I have the feeling that I had to walk in his footsteps, but at the same time, I have felt that because he was so young at the time he died, and there were so many things that he left unfinished, that if ever the opportunity arose, I would like to finish his work for him, out, out of love. I think that she was impatient. There was, she, she wanted to have, she wanted to create a life of her own where she felt that she was being useful and fulfilled. And, it, and also a, a life that related to Burma, you know, this was important to her. I think to some extent it must have been so, or she wouldn't have written a letter to Michael when she got married saying, look, if, if, if my country calls, I'll be gone. I only ask one thing, that should my people need me, you would help me to do my duty by them. Sometimes I'm beset by fears that circumstances and national considerations might tear us apart just when we're so happy in each other that separation would be a torment. And yet, I'm sure that love and compassion will triumph in the end. He did say, didn't he, more than once, that he knew when he was marrying her, if the choice came, she would go to her country. She had always warned him, and he said he would accept this, and he would understand, and he would help her to do it, which he did, in every possible way, when it did happen. It was a quiet evening in Oxford, like many others. The last day of March, 1988. Our sons were already in bed, and we were reading. When the phone rang... It was like, you know, when you're dying, it's just the slight knocking at the door. You know, it's something which is very, almost imperceptible. And it was just the call at 11 o'clock at night saying that her mother had had a stroke and would she go back to Burma to look after her, Dorkin Key. And, yeah, that, that, that was the demand, that was the, the call. But at that stage, I don't think Michael sort of realised the full Monty. I mean, he didn't realise that this was it, this was the balloon had gone up. She fell into it in the sense that she had that background, she had that heritage. But that heritage would not, I think, have determined her destiny if it hadn't been that there was a series of events that coincided when she went to visit her mother. After I arrived in June, there was more, there, there was more trouble uh, at the university. And then, of course, August, you, you know about August when the whole country rose up. During, during the troubles for most of the time, she was in the hospital with her, with her mother. You see, she didn't really come out. Michael, I saw. I can't remember exactly when he turned out, but he, he was out there by the time the August demonstrations really got going. I had met her the year before because they, the family came out the year before and in a quite relaxed way uh, put their children through the um, ceremony of, of, of novices, Buddhist novices. And, uh, and she was um, cool and elegant and not political at that point. There was no sign of her entering into politics. Um, her mother was still alive. Um, so the transition was very extraordinary, really. At first, we were expecting her big brother to be the leader of Burma one day. but. He didn't turn up to be like that, not at all. She has a brother who, who was a bit of a ne'er-do-well and, and I think lives in America and is really on the side of the government and I suspect is jealous of his sister. Aung San Suu Kyi emerged, not quite sure what to do to begin with, but then she did emerge as the leader 
of the democratic movement. The first major big speech when she burst out was, was at the Trader Grand Pagoda. I didn't go, I didn't go because, again, I think I didn't want to give too much of the impression of, 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 of being, that she had the British behind her. There was a big crowd. I've never seen such a big crowd before in my life. The people were seeing this desire for democracy, the desire for human rights. This is when I came into the movement. At first, you know, I thought that she was just another general's daughter. That was my first impression because I never met her before, you know, personally. And then she started talking to the people. So I was overwhelmed by her speeches. You know, I was shocked. Oh, this is the one we were looking for. She's the true leader. You know, I could imagine. I could imagine that scene. I was very much impressed. This is the one we were looking for. She made a, a very effective performance there. She, she obviously took to politics like a duck to water. I thought that she was very sincere, very charming, very beautiful. And she spoke, she was very outspoken. And then she said, as a daughter of Aung San, as a daughter of a, a independence hero, she knows very well that she must do something for the people. And she's ready to do, she's ready to sacrifice for the people. That's the first one. And it really hit all of us. It really touched all of us. And then after that, uh, so I decided I'm going to support her no matter what. On the 2nd of January, 1989, Aung San Suu Kyi's mother is buried. Your mother died and you stayed. Yes, because by that time I had another family here, the family with whom I worked, my colleagues. And I think for Michael in those early stages, the knock at the door, the telephone call at 11 o'clock at night, the call back to Burma, and then Milestrom of 88 and then 89. I don't think he realized quite what that Calvary was going to be, that, that long um, Saharan sort of crossing, um, because it started sotto voce and then it became sort of glorious technicolor. After the troubles were over, the Burmese government surprisingly said, right, you can have elections and you can have them in two years' time, and, uh, but you're not allowed to do any serious electioneering. She paid no attention to that and was nearly shot when she went um, and, and held the main speeches out in the country. And then there was this adoration of these people, these expectations. She was suddenly elevated to this pedestal. National League for Democracy had very strong support from the people right from the beginning. And this support got stronger and stronger as 1988 ended. Suddenly, what had seemed impossible was going to be possible. And it went on because in the late May of 1990, you had that 80% constituency vote for the NLD. When the slot found that things had not gone the way they thought, they would not honor the results of the elections. More of our leaders were arrested and uh, the slot started taking steps to make it difficult for the NLD to function as a political party. What shall I say? They are very um, cunning, you know, and blocking her. When she went to uh, Irrawaddy Delta, you know, she was blocked and she was stranded there for five days on a bridge. And then, she, you know, she, she, she may have some biscuits in her car, but how about going to the loo, you know, 
and but she, uh, some of my friends, you know, uh, accompanied her, um, but because they formed her uh, an early body in '89, and they told me she could stay without sleeping, she could stay without drinking or eating for quite some time. So. In, in terms of controlling herself. She can go on fasting for days, she was quite used to. So that's good for her, you know, staying for house arrest for six years for the first time. On the 20th of July, 1989, Aung San Suu Kyi is placed under house arrest by the military. So the rumors are, are there all the time. And the, the military will put her under house arrest. No, but then that day, somebody came back and said to me and to all the others in our house, our lots of soldiers are around on the Suti house. Somebody who lived on the same uh, road as I do came to tell us quite early in the morning that uh, there were troops and, and uh, barricades at the top of the street and that he thought that there was something, that something was going to happen. We were expecting to be arrested that day. Yeah. Well, they did come in, but they didn't arrest me. They arrested the others, took them out of, Why out of the garden. Why didn't they arrest you? Well, they placed me under house arrest. They put me under different, um, d d different um, section of the law. Yeah. Why did I think they I was do under that, 10 B. I think probably because I'm my father's daughter. Yes. In the quiet land, no one can tell. If there is someone who is listening for secrets, they can sell. The informers are paid in the blood of the land, and no one dares speak what the tyrants won't stand. In the quiet land of Burma, no one laughs and no one thinks out loud. In the quiet land of Burma, you can hear it in the silence of the crowd. I was allowed to see Michael off at the airport, um, where he had a very small military intelligence minder out there, and we were up there, and, and he said to me when we were speaking, he said, speak down a bit, because he's not a bad fellow, and he wants to, he needs to report what we've said. So he, he was, he had a good, you know, he was prepared still to have a good uh, laugh at things, which, which, which was very encouraging. In July 1990, Michael accepts the Sakharov Prize on behalf of his wife. Michael seemed to be fairly uh, accepting of the situation and, you know, fairly kind of, uh, how can I put it, uh, uh, resigned, resigned, but also extremely active on her behalf. All right. I will convey this to her when I can. You, you, you have uh, not had the possibility no. to meet her in, no. uh, in 18 months. Then this is not, uh, they say it's, uh, uh, how do you call it in English, arresto domiciliario. House arrest. It is house, house arrest. But it is this very... This is not house arrest. Well, it's very strange. This is uh, total uh, isolation. Isolation, isolation. incommunicado. Incommunicado. Yeah. I have only rumor and conjecture, but I will say that 18 months ago, when I was with her, she was treated courteously by her guards. It was clear from her letters a year ago that that appeared to continue. There have been conflicting rumors about her condition since then. What I do know for sure is that the regime has applied very, very strong pressure on her to go into exile. They have offered her freedom if she chooses exile. Well, you know, the family is, of course, very important, but then the question always ar arise when you are a politician or when you are activists, what will you do? No? If you are always looking back to your family, sometimes you cannot make a decision.
In the beginning, I did write to my family. Of course, it was the letters were censored. They all had to be sent through the authorities, and they would write back. But um, towards the end of 1990, then I didn't communicate with my family anymore. Not anymore? Why not? It is because I did not wish to communicate through the authorities. In the early first 20 years of their marriage, she was the North Oxford housewife. And of course, after 88, that completely turned on its axis, 180 degrees. And it was Michael who was not the focus any longer. It was Sue that there was the focus. And Michael was there to provide the support, to bring up the children, to provide the, to drive them to school, to make their meals. The young one was only 12, mm. and uh, he had to be put into boarding school. So, of course, naturally, I worried about these things. Yes. But then I would always remind myself that the families of my colleagues were far worse mm. off, because uh, those of my colleagues who were put in prison in Burma, their families were also insecure. So they would have had to worry about mm. their families, as well as coping with Mm. prison conditions, whereas I didn't have to worry about my family at all. I knew they were safe. Yeah. In the 90s, then it became, the reality began to dawn. Here he was, a single father uh, in Parktown, almost retreating up into the attic because at some stage, you know, he, the Parktown house was let and he was up in the, up in the rafters, uh, looking after his children, being a, as good a father as possible. The tides of Burma lapping to the door of, of Parktown, you know, faxes and messages and requests for interviews, um, press releases, doing what he could. Well, Michael was absolutely devoted to her cause. I mean, he, he spent an enormous amount of time lobbying for her discreetly and sometimes not so discreetly. He told me once that she told him she, she wanted him to lay off a bit because, you know, he was, he was becoming too prominent and he, he was offering himself as a target to the government saying that, you know, she was a British stooge. That was always something that she had to be aware of. How will you describe the situation in Burma today? That is very difficult for me to do. Firstly, because I'm not there and I have no contact with Burma. There's almost no news coming out of Burma. Secondly, what little I do know, it's better, honestly, for me not to say too much. The situation is critical. There is much talk of human rights abuse. If I make comments upon the situation, it will all rebound on my wife. It will not improve my, my chances of seeing her again. As the Javanese say, Tutwuri Andayani, to follow behind and serve as a good woman should do in terms of a marriage in the Javanese context. I think that was for Michael in reverse. That was what he was doing. He was following behind and serving, but in an incredibly discreet and subtle and effective fashion. He was carried away in a whirlwind of efforts and initiatives and awards that he accepted and his children accepted on her behalf, you know, one prize after the other. Alexander had just finished his school, he was around 18, he seemed kind of sad, like a very sad boy. Kim was more active and lively and sort of, you know, but slightly restless. I will now call upon Michael, Alexander and Kim Aris to come forward to receive the gold medal and the diploma on behalf of their wife and mother the Nobel Peace Prize Laureate 1991, Aung San Suu Kyi. It's, it's a tough one. I think if you're a child, it's a very tough one. You know, if a parent dies, that's one thing, but if a parent dies and then is transmogrified into a sort of modern-day Joan of Arc, that's quite another thing. And she was the Joan of Arc for modern Burma. Um, and it was a difficult one because you're, you're, you're living with a mother which is still, who is still alive, but yet unreachable. This is the second time that my younger brother and I have 
accepted a great prize for my mother in Norway. The impact on the children, I think, was of considerable emotional cost and emotional turmoil uh, to them as young adults growing up, um, buffeted by the winds of this particular calling. Michael was a very good father and kept the family close and looked after them very well. It was always a close family. Fortunately, I mean, it must have been very difficult for them not to have Sue, though they have been there, haven't they, more than once. They took away the children's Burmese passports. The children had been holding Burmese passports, but they took them away immediately after they went back to England. And uh, so in December, my husband came alone. But after that, they were not allowed to come until 1992. The ideal of the mother is the one who nurtures, protects her children against the world and who is always there. If you somehow set aside your children at any point, you will be judged hardly, harshly. To blame Sue, as some commentators have done, for sort of a dereliction of her duty as a mother, well, what about the Buddha, um, you know, leaving his family at the age of 32, or Mandela? If you are a father, you will be seen as someone who abandons your duties to provide, but not so much the intimate, loving, nurturance, you know, a side that we all need and, and that everybody wants. Although my mother is often described as a political dissident who strives by peaceful means for democratic change, we should remember that her quest is basically spiritual. As she has said, the quintessential revolution is that of the spirit. And where she gets the strength from, I don't know. But she does get it. I think from Buddhism. I got given that by a Burmese mm. abbot in Mandalay first time round. In Buddhism, we are taught that the four uh, basic ingredients, if you like, yeah. for success are, first of all, you must have the will to want it, mm. to want something. And then, uh, then you must have the right kind of attitude. Mm. And then you must have perseverance. And then you must have wisdom. And so you combine these four and you get where you want to get to. Every day of the week, in Burma's official media, Sue is vilified, calumnied, slandered, taunted, ridiculed, and insulted. In the cowardly way adopted by soldiers who have lost their sense of honor and dignity, she has no right of reply. Even if she did, she would be the last person to reply in kind, for she has never stooped to personal abuse. Instead, she invokes those timeless principles of human justice, dignity, and nonviolence that derive from her Buddhist faith. Sue was never a religious person, not a spiritual person, not a, a goody-goody sort of, you know, born-again Buddhist. But I think she has tasted what that tradition is all about. She has walked the Buddha's path in a very sort of un- ostentatious way. I mean, as the Buddha said, you know, it's not in sacred books, it's not in, in my teaching, you know, it's the only thing which is of value is what makes you understand the truth. And I think that that has happened for Sue. It's not happened in a context of retreats, it's not happened in the context of a Zen monastery, it hasn't needed to, because that particular path has brought her face to face on a day-to-day -day basis with the truth. Loneliness comes from inside. You know, people who are free and who live in big cities, you, you, you hear so much that they suffer from terrible loneliness. So I think loneliness comes from inside.
In July 1995, the military junta suddenly announces that they intend to release Aung San Suu Kyi from house arrest. Today, her English husband was waiting to hear if her release was genuinely unconditional. Like all of us, we're simply waiting to hear it from her own lips. In the meantime, of course, we have a great deal of hope that the situation will finally unlock. On Monday, when I knew I was going to be free, I didn't know what to think. I thought, I'm going to be free. But uh, once I'd met my colleagues, I was very, very happy. The first person I saw after I was free was Uchi Mao, who led our party to victory in 1990, and his wife. And the moment I saw them, then I was really happy. But before that, I didn't know what to think. I just thought, well, I'm going to be free. This means I'm going to have to work a lot harder. They, they'd uh, confined her for, for, for many years. They then tried the experiment of letting her out hoping, I think, that the populace would have forgotten her, and it became very clear that they hadn't forgotten her. In particular, in an atmosphere of, of really pretty well total suppression of liberty, to have this phenomenon of Suu Kyi leaning over her garden wall and making speeches to a large crowd uh, who laughed at her jokes and so on, even if she didn't attack the government. <laughs> It was it was obviously intolerable. It was something that really couldn't couldn't last. You, one had the feeling that it was doomed. Today she is no longer exactly a prisoner in her house after six years of house arrest. She was released from the prison that was her home into the prison that is her country. It is for that reason, again, that she cannot be here tonight, that I, this fraud, find myself standing in her place. She asked me to convey to you her great love and her great esteem. And when I next Talk to her on the telephone with your permission. I shall, if I may, convey your love to her. Do some that. From 1995 and onwards, all Michael's requests for a visa to Burma were denied by the military government. When the dot is of the lippen, much you need to courage you listen. When death is on one's lips, you must never lose your courage. Michael was just like that, never giving up, always loyal, never losing his courage. I don't think that, that Michael's death uh, was anything she expected, and I think that must have been a terrible blow. She rang me up and said, do something. Um, and when I saw him, uh, there was nothing I could do. It was too late. Um, I think, I think he shouldn't have died. I think he... Well, I first knew that Michael was sick in um, January of 1999. 
Um, he had come back, I think, from a holiday or a, a visit, and he got in touch with me to say, Peter, I've got two pieces of news for you. One is I have cancer, and the other is I'm going to beat it. You know, I'm going to be able to survive. I'm going to, I'm going to be okay. And I went to see Michael, and I kept in sort of uh, touch with him in those, in those months up to his death on the 27th of March, and very significant date was his birthday, and it was the date of the Battle of Mactila, was the beginning of the road to independence, of full independence in Burma after the, at the end of the war. Um, and in, in that time, all those who had been Michael sort of, had known Michael, from the Dalai Lama to the Philippine government, offered all sorts of resources to bring, you know, a hospital plane to take Michael to Rangoon, and all sorts of resources were, were offered. It wasn't as though that Michael was bereft, because he wasn't. When Michael was, you know, was dying, Aung San Suu Kyi, at first she thought that he might get a permission to come back to Burma. Because, you know, even if one person is sentenced to death, his last wish was always fulfilled. The last wish, if, if one person is about to die, the last wish is always fulfilled, but not in their case. I mean, these generals, being the people they are, you know, sort of played with them and allowed them some contact, and they would cut off the phone, or they would, you know, these are Voyou, you know, they're gutter snipes. Um, they have no nobility. She couldn't leave. If she had left, she wouldn't have been allowed back. It couldn't have been a more sort of absolute moment to put a decision like that to her. And Michael certainly wasn't going to ask Sue to go down the other path, to actually come out and to be with him, um, because that would have been an abnegation of everything that he had struggled for, with um, they had both struggled for. When he died, she lost her main knight in shining armor, the one who was defending and fighting for her, trying to slay the dragon for her. I'm so fortunate to have had such a wonderful husband who always understood my needs. Nothing can take that away from me. You know, I mean, the crematorium is not the most elevated of, of environments, but Sue sent her a bouquet of flowers. But it wasn't a bouquet of flowers. She just sent her children out into the meadows to gather whatever flowers they could find. And those are the flowers which were put on his a wreath on the memorial, and it seemed to sort of sum up, you know, that there was a sort of beauty to that. It was almost as though al fresco, it was, you know, it happened at, à l'improviste, as the French say. This next reading is one for which my father had a particular fondness. It's called the salutation to the dawn. Look to this day for it is life, the very life of life. For in its brief span lie all the verities and realities of existence. The bliss of growth, the splendor of action, the glory of power. For every yesterday is but a dream and every tomorrow is only a vision. But today, well lived, makes every yesterday a dream of happiness and every tomorrow a hope. Look well, therefore, to this day. soul is, is, is this sense of somebody who will walk the journey that they have to go and you know not be afraid not flinch from it I think that's what it means
I think they, they probably both put their, the role they were playing with Burma ahead of, 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 of their children. I mean, how could they not do that? The Buddha, you know, he left his son, he left his wife, and he went out into the, into the forests uh, to gain um, the secret and to, to gain through to enlightenment. And what Sue is doing for Burma is gaining through to enlightenment in a political sense. This is the, um, she is there bearing witness. She may die bearing witness, but even if she dies bearing witness, that resonance, that momentum will continue to resonate uh, throughout Burma's modern uh, future. She said that she would consider leaving under four conditions. She laid down four conditions. The first of these conditions was the release of all political prisoners in Burma. The second condition was a transfer of power to the elected civilian government. The third condition was that she demanded 50 minutes on radio and on television. And the fourth of her demands was that she would walk to the airport. There was no response. I didn't come here and say, you've got to work for democracy. It's the people of Burma who ask for democracy because they know that until they have the kind of political system that guarantees their basic rights, they will have to live in fear and insecurity forever. The situation in Burma is as gloomy as 40 years ago. The situation is the same under this military regime. No see freedom of speech, no freedom of expression, and no human rights at all. The story is safe. And people cannot see any way out. That the idea of real freedom, which I've always said is freedom from fear. You, know, you can be, I was a prisoner, but I, I felt that I was free because I was not frightened. And I thought that a lot of people who were out there were uh, living in such difficult circumstances. Perhaps they were less free than I was. Perhaps they were frightened. And if they were frightened, they were certainly less free than I was. So for me, real freedom is freedom from fear. Butterfree is not in Norway. Butterfree is not in America. Butterfree is in Rangoon. A fighter must be in the Butterfree. She is not only the fighter. She is a commander. So she must stay with her forces. Nothing comes free. And if you want something that is valuable, then you have to make payment accordingly. She sacrificed her his whole family. That is a very, very, you see, precious value of our Sanskrit.